I really love to talk about the use of technology in language teaching. So today I'm going to venture into something else, uh, primarily because you've had a dose of technology in content-based teaching, so I'm not going to venture into technology. I'm going to um, you know, try to take you one step ahead of content-based teaching, because we all know about content-based teaching, and you must be wondering, now what? So I'm going to try out, um, and I would also like to uh, acknowledge right at the beginning that um, the examples, the vignettes that I'm taking for my talk are from uh, an article that I've written. Um, uh, so people who've read that might see that there is there are some overlaps. However, I'm trying to uh, move out from that and get into a field called multidisciplinarity. So uh, I'm going to move into something called multidisciplinarity in the ESL classroom. And I feel this is a good way uh, for us as teachers of English to take content-based teaching forward. Um, and uh, I do mention this during my talk too, you know, especially for us as teachers in India, where we really do not have much control over uh, the curriculum or the materials, you know, when a textbook is given to us, when the syllabus is prescribed, and we have, as teachers, we have not much role to play in that. Um, what do we do with content-based teaching? How do we handle that? And this is especially when multidisciplinarity comes into play. Um, I would also like to acknowledge my, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's really funny how you remember people uh, once you lose them and how you remember all that you learned from them once they are gone. So I lost my father recently. And when I was looking at multidisciplinarity, I was thinking, you know, the the origin of multidisciplinarity in me, I think, came through my father. Uh, because all the things that I remember now, well, most of it, a large majority of it, you know, um, uh, things like uh, Rex and Regina, you know, uh, the words and concepts and themes that I remember now uh, are all taught, uh, you know, to me by my father through multidisciplinarity. To give you an example, um, there was this dog called Rex, and it's my father who told me that in Latin, Rex is king, and you know, Regina is queen, and and. And lots of examples like that Felis Domesticus as cat and, and stuff like that. Of course, he was uh, a zoologist. And uh, there was this, uh, what I especially remember is this lesson called Binti the Unhappy Duck, which was in class two, I think. I must have been in class one or two. And there's this lesson called Binti the Unhappy Duck. And, uh, you know, from the lesson, he went on to duck back the raincoat and he was telling us how um, you know duckback is the brand of a raincoat and how you know why it is named duckback because you know water doesn't stay on the back of a duck and from there he went on to tell us about um, preen glands it's because of preen glands the oil in preen glands that a duck stays um, dry right and then from there he went on to tell us about how we use the word preen to you know to, to make oneself look beautiful. So preening as a verb and so on. So this is basically multidisciplinarity. And this is what I'm talking about today. Um, I hope you can all see the screen um, and that I am audible. Shall I start then? Please do. All right. Yeah, thank you. So um, this is something that I would like you all to you know start off with. What do we see are the goals of education? I'm also going to post an answer garden link in the chat box. Those of you who are familiar with answer garden would know that this is a tool that you see, I told you digital literacy is something that I like and I can't stop myself from using digital tools. So this is a tool that allows you to kind of make your voices heard, make your opinion heard. So do take a look at what we have on the screen. Um, out of these 12, 
which ones do you think are goals of education? So I was telling you today that I attended a little bit of what Cherry was speaking about yesterday and what Lena was talking about today. So it's only based on these that I can now refashion my con my conversation with you. And I'm going to take you one step back. That is, you know, think about us um, as teachers and ask ourselves, why are we, uh, you know, teaching our students? What are our instructional goals? What do we mean when we say that our students are getting educated? So what are the goals of education? Do take a look at these 12 and um, let me know on Answer Garden or even on chat box, you know, which ones do you most agree with? What, what do you most uh, agree with? Um, let me take a look at the, the Answer Garden. Okay, yeah, I already have somebody saying maybe everything except number seven. All right, I'm going to go back to that tab. Let's see. Right, okay. So I have someone who said everything except seven. I have someone who said um, number one. I have... Uh, build a person you just need to put in the number that's it don't bother to uh, type because i have limited the number of words that you can put in in answer garden so just put in the number that you most agree with or the numbers that you most agree with uh, i'll go back to my screen so that you can see the powerpoint slide i have a three i have a one Okay, critical thinkers, except number seven, memorize information. All right, yeah. Um, you know, those of you who find it difficult to access Answer Garden, please feel free to put it in the chat box to the numbers that you most agree with. What do you think are the goals of education? Okay, I have, right, all right, yes. So I think everybody seems to be staying away from um, number seven, okay? Yeah, which is, of course, a, uh, it, it's a very problematic thing to say that we are not interested in memorizing information. But yes, rote learning and memorizing information is something that um, all of us claim isn't a good uh, learning technique, instructional technique. However, let me just point out, I think there is a... Uh, right, yes, like Arindam was pointing out, let me just uh, remind you the way we learned A, B, C, D, yeah, the alphabet, the letters of the alphabet. We kept saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, you know, we kept singing, 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 twinkle, twinkle, little star, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, arbitrary. So there is a little bit of memorizing coming in, even into the most meaningful learning. It's not to say that memorizing is a good way of teaching, but then yes, in some instances, like uh, Dr. Senbukta pointed out, it's an okay thing to do too. However, yeah, what I want you all to remember here is that no, you know, when we go into a classroom, we don't go into the classroom um, thinking that my students should be getting into a high paid job or I need to make them uh, lead a better life and so on. It, these are, this is not the goal that we keep in mind. If you look at the latest reports by UNESCO and uh, the World Economic Forum and, and, uh, and who is the other one, uh, the, uh, the Science Journal and uh, you know, Science Journal 2021 also had an article that said that education actually can help people live healthier and longer uh, it can help people have healthy children it can reduce disaster deaths um, it can combat climate change so there's a lot of purposes of education and as teachers what is it that we can do in order to help our learners achieve all of this you know achieve all the purposes or goals of education and corona or covid covid 19 corona as we know it um, isn't too distant a memory. Think about how did we address uh, COVID? You know, 
during lockdown time? How did we control transmission during COVID? There were multiple people who came in. You know, we were thinking about masks, designing the right kind of masks. We were thinking about air filtering. We were thinking about work from home options. There were um, uh, money or transacting money was an issue. Religion was an issue. You know, in, in my house, people started attending the mass from home. I mean, you're attending mass uh, looking at a TV. You're watching TV while attending a religious ceremony. So uh, religion was redesigned, refashioned. Ethics, morals, medicines, everything was, you know, everybody came into play. So that's why I thought this picture is something that will make it very clear that um, sanity workers, social workers, um, uh, I mean, sorry, sanitation workers, social workers, policemen, uh, medical workers, everybody had to come in together to address uh, Corona or to control transmission during COVID. And did education prepare us for this? You know how or how did education prepare us for this? This is what we mean by addressing a problem from an interdisciplinary perspective where multiple disciplines come in and uh, try to solve an issue or try to solve an address uh, try to address a problem and this is what we mean by interdisciplinary teaching or multidisciplinary teaching because in order to meet all the goals of education that we've been talking about remember montessori montessori who said that the most successful teacher or for me the success of my teaching is when i can look at my students and see that they are working as if i do not exist so developing independent learning developing autonomous learners to achieve everything that education claims is its goals to achieve every goal stated by educationists one the primary factor that we have to consider is that curriculum or the syllabus or the curriculum or what we teach our students should reflect real life goals or real life needs what are we teaching them for we are teaching them to later on go out and work in society in, in a society so we are hoping that they reach their personal goals their social goals and their professional goals through education and this doesn't happen when you when you consider disciplines in silos you know uh, this is uh, this large tanks where you store grains in, in granaries and in, in larger industrial sectors. Those large tanks are called silos. So if you consider knowledge in silos, like the first picture that I have, math in a separate container, English in a separate container, science separately, social studies separately, and so on. So if we are thinking of compartmentalizing different subjects into uh different uh, containers and we see no link between them then education remains pointless education remains useless it is unauthentic so education if it has to be authentic and if it has to deliver value for our students it has to the curriculum has to reflect real life and real life is never you know in real life nobody is going to ask you to uh, recite the periodic table or nobody is going to ask you the rule for uh, you know using articles nobody will ask you what is a plus b the whole square you know this is that's not real life in real life you're not required to memorize and reproduce everything that you've learned in school real life problems are more multidisciplinary in nature they are very complex they are very um, they are very um, a fluid you know there are no clear boundaries that no single discipline can address complex real world problems that's why i was giving you the example of uh, covid transmission so there isn't a single discipline that can address all the problems that uh, that we face in real world or any issues that we face in real world so what we have to do is think about bringing in insights from different disciplines and synthesizing that information bring that information together and integrate these ideas so this is this this is how everything works in the real world i mean think about any context think about your own home 
you know the kind of problems that you address at home um, or think it's not your education or the subject knowledge that comes into play when you when you're addressing issues or solving problems or just running your home even when you're just running your home it's not compartmentalized uh, knowledge that comes into play so this is primarily what i'm talking about and as an example i would uh, yeah so please take a look at the last picture that we have here um this is what interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary knowledge is all about where you are not putting them in separate tanks or separate silos or separate containers but you are charting a path across different subjects or across different disciplines now let me make that clear with an example this is the example that i've taken from my paper um there is miss dhanya who is teaching an english classroom this is from class 12 i thought it would be easier for us to understand when we no class 10 i think yeah yeah it's a class 10 lesson yes so um uh, she's teaching this lesson on nelson mandela long walk to freedom and it's an excerpt from mandela's autobiography okay when the teacher looks at the objective of the lesson the teacher sees that the objectives are understanding i would like to put that in the chat box you know so that uh, you keep that in mind this is one of the objectives of the lesson. Okay. So this is an objective stated within the lesson, that the lesson aims to help students understand concepts of freedom and equality. A very noble objective and, uh, uh, and something that is required um, of, of our students. Let me guess. So this is what one is supposed to teach through this lesson, concepts of freedom and equality. Of course, in addition to several other language learning goals. And uh, the teacher identifies three tasks in the, in the lesson. Do take a look at these tasks. It says, one says, in groups, discuss um, these issues. Yeah, True liberty is freedom from poverty, deprivation, and all forms of discrimination. And uh, it says, prepare a speech of about two minutes on the following topic. Causes of poverty and means of overcoming it. Discrimination based on gender, religion, class, etc. Constitutionally guaranteed human rights. Now, what happens with a task like this? Do take a look at the other tasks too. The one here says, do you think there is color prejudice in your own country? Okay. And write a paragraph. And then there's another one that says, uh, find more information on black Americans and their fight against discrimination, and so on and so forth. Let's just focus on the first task. Now, these are three tasks that the teachers um, said that they do not administer in the class for obvious reasons. The students are just not able to do these tasks. You know, So these tasks were never administered for years. They have not been administered in the class. Why is that the case? Because this particular lesson, that's an excerpt of Mandela's autobiography, doesn't really prepare them for this. It talks about the, you know, the his the freedom struggle. It talks about the historic occasion of, you know, the inauguration of the, the, a new country being formed and so on. Now, it doesn't give them enough information about causes of poverty doesn't talk about causes of poverty means of overcoming it doesn't talk about discrimination based on gender religion and class it doesn't talk about constitutionally guaranteed human rights so due to various constraints these these tasks have never been addressed in the classroom because students need additional content they know about the indian constitution but not in this context they do not know enough about the other things so students are not able to do these tasks okay and the teacher actually wants to wants students to understand all types of discriminations understand about you know achieve the objective of the lesson that i've put in the chat box and to um, you know in order to do uh, to achieve all these what she does is the teacher does is she seeks the help of other teachers teaching in class 10 
So this is where multidisciplinarity comes in. The teacher puts out, don't worry about the tool that is used here. It's of course, I mean, you can see that it's a mind map. I also noticed that Lena did share some tools with you on, you know, tools that will help you create mind maps. My mind map is created, this particular mind map is created using spider scribe. My students tell me that it's an old ancient tool and that it's, you know, it, it has its limitations. But maybe because I started working on spider scribe, I kind of find it quite familiar, you know. So let's get back to the teacher, Dhanya. Okay. So what does the teacher do? Why doesn't my screen blow? Ah, right. So the teacher puts out a request in the form of a mind map to all the teachers teaching in class 10 and says, hey, this is my you know, English lesson. There is a lesson on Mandela. And it there is a group discussion task that talks about equality for all. And it also needs my students to know about the Indian constitution. It want, wants them to compare struggles with other, you know, those in other countries, global struggles, and so on. So she's put out everything in this purple. I, um, uh, Professor Lal or Ahana, is there anyone who is visually um, challenged in this group? No, ma'am, I don't think so. Okay, okay. So I don't have to read out the slide contents. No, thank you. So, um, right, so everything in purple is what the English teacher sent out. And the other teachers take a look at it. It's, it's a collaborative mind map, okay? Spider Scribe, like other tools that Lena shared with you too, are tools that allow you to work together with others. So she shares it with other teachers in class 10. And uh, everybody takes a look at it. And the history teacher and the civics teacher respond. The history teacher says, hey, Comparing struggles in our country with those in others. I have a lesson that is similar to that. And the history teacher says it is lesson number one uh, on contemporary world and lesson number two on nationalism. And it has references to Italians and Germans and their fight. It has references to Martin Luther King and the Grimm brothers and so on. So the history teacher gives that. And the civics teacher says, I have chapter three and chapter four on gender, religion, and caste and chapter three on democracy and diversity so why don't you take a look at that you see so teachers are coming in together here and 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 um, imagine the newly constructed or the redesigned task imagine how much richer or how much more purposeful it becomes for a student when they go back to the speaking task they have a lot of information they have a lot of content they have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, not knowledge, information, content, and facts. Yeah, they have a lot of facts. And so approaching this speaking task becomes easier. You know, it is facilitated because they have a lot of content in them. So all I'm saying in this talk is this, that yes, bring in content. So this is what content-based teaching is all about. But bring in content from multiple disciplines, not just just, not just, one discipline but bring in content from multiple disciplines because that will also empower our learners to face the world or solve real world problems this is basically what i'm talking about here's a quick task for you i have two story outlines on the screen take a look at story one and story two these scaffolded our story outlines that we give our students do take a look at one and two and tell me in the chat box which one do you find easier if i were to ask you to speak or elaborate or complete this story and tell me you know which one would you think you can do quickly one or two which is easy all right, so uh, most of us, um, I don't know why the others are, you know, um, yeah, yeah, don't try to make sense of what is there, but do a quick read and tell what is what is easier for you. Yeah, I would say that too, you know. Um, why do we think that the second one is easy? Yes, exactly, Ruth has, Yes, Dr. Anil Kumar, I'll come back to you for the story of number one. But yes, like I was about to ask, why do you think we are? Uh, aha, all right, sustainable development. Yes, 
Okay, yes. Uh, so I was about to, I'll come back to that maybe at the end of this conversation. But uh, as Ruth was pointing out, the second one is easier for us, most probably because we are familiar with the story. We know about the old man who is on his deathbed and uh, his three sons who are fighting. He calls them together and asks them to bring a bundle of sticks and you know, ask them to break that story, the story that we are all familiar with. So this is something that I would like you to always bear in mind. You know, when there is content, when there is enough content to support us, let me just put this back in there yeah when when there is familiarity in content then production becomes easier just keep that in mind so if there is a lot of content this happens with all the time right if we were to ask our uh, students to talk about cultural appropriation as opposed to social media which one would they find easier? Of course, it depends on levels of students. If we were to ask our students to describe, uh, you know, talk about racism as opposed to uh, a festival that they celebrate, something like that. So think about the relation between content and language. There is something called a trade-off effect that if you apply too much focus on one thing, then the other things are bound to suffer. So if you are given a speaking task, if you are given a spoken task, as in if I take story number one as a speaking task, what are you trying to do? You are trying to make sense of the content. So it's cognitively challenging. And then you are trying to put it out in the form of language. So there are the too many things that are in this cognitive overload. There is load on your brain. So one good thing that we can do for our students if we are thinking about focusing on language development or second language development is to give them a lot of content give them a lot of facts and information that they can use so that once facts are there in their cognition in their brain all they need to do is focus on their articulation pay attention to how they are speaking the words that they are using the grammar that they are using so they're attention can be paid to linguistic accuracy. So this is basically what multidisciplinarity is all about. You're giving them a lot of content so that you can pay explicit attention to language development. So uh, this is something that, uh, uh, that multidisciplinarity is all about. And Steve Jobs has said it in a, in a very beautiful way. I don't even want to attempt uh, uh, another version of this because this is the best that there can be. Um, but here is another example. You know, the, the, the lake, the picture of lake that you see here, this is another example like COVID, like uh, the COVID transmission that I was talking about. This is a familiar site for many of us in India, you know, because we see many of our lakes choked with algae and uh, and many of our lakes suffering actually reeling under human population and activities of human population so what happens is there is poor water quality there is invasive species there is um, algae there is toxic algae there are um, there is fish dying there are fish kills you know and poison the level of poison increases and uh, but this doesn't mean that the human population that lives around the lake should suffer right now how do we help the lake and help the people around it so uh, for a particular example there were a team that worked together to save the lake and save the people who live around it included a biologist a chemist a sustainability expert of coastal communities because this was a backwater I mean, this was close to a coastal community an environmental expert a social scientist a political strategist and an economic analyst this is how real world problems are solved and this is what the real world is all about think about any office setting you know think about your own places, the places where you teach, or uh, think about offices where our students might eventually end up in. Nowhere are you asked to sit alone and write an essay. 
Nowhere are you asked to sit alone and read a passage and answer comprehension questions, right? So everywhere, this is what is required. It is collaboration. It is people coming in together that is required. And this is what the world needs. And uh, that's the you know biggest argument that I can make towards um, uh, for in favor of multidisciplinary learning. So if you are to bring in changes individually, locally and globally it is only multidisciplinarity that can help us so this is why i'm i'm pushing on or pushing for multidisciplinary curriculum or using multidisciplinarity in our classrooms a multidisciplinary curriculum may not be possible like i told you right at the beginning since curriculum design or syllabus design or even textbook design is more often than not you know not in the purview or domain of teachers so uh, the little bit of multidisciplinarity that we can bring in is in terms of instructional practices, like the English teacher talking to civics teacher and history teacher and bringing in a little bit of content into the classroom. This is this is the best that we can do. So um, uh, there is also something that I would like you to read. I think I have put that in somewhere here. Yeah, I, let me put that in the chat box this is a report that will definitely help you understand more about multidisciplinary curriculum okay this is uh may 2018 yeah it's a 2018 report of a joint task force from national academies of sciences engineering and medicine and we are all familiar with stem subjects in the light of what uh, Steve Jobs talked about, there is now increasingly, uh, I mean, increasingly people are considering adding arts to STEM subjects. So it becomes STEAM, you know, so it's science, technology, engineering, arts, and medicine. So this is, this is what multidisciplinarity is all about. Um, so um, here is another example. Let me just put this down. Yeah. Okay, this is um, an example that is taken from, uh, you know, an internet resource. But what one of my uh, beard, yeah, one of the beard students did was uh, she used this idea to create a multidisciplinary approach when she was teaching the Brook by Tennyson. You know, this is. We are all familiar with that, right? We must have learned it in, in school. So when she was teaching a poem, The Brook by Lord Tennyson, she used that as uh, her central concept. And then she brought in something from mathematics, something from arts, taking off from this idea. She uh, you know, brought in a multidisciplinary curriculum into, uh, into her classroom. OK. Mm, OK. So uh, moving on, I would like us to think about how can we now implement it? I'm not going to spend too much time here because I realize, you know, this is the advantage of uh, speaking on day two or day three, because a lot of experts have already talked a lot about this to you. So you are familiar with it. In fact, you are much more familiar with this than I am, most probably. So um, I'm going to quickly run through this. That two models that I basically prefer. One is the immersion model. Remember what uh, Lena was talking about in the form of English medium. When you when you talk about an English medium school or English medium instruction, that is an immersion model. But sometimes English is not taught, even taught as a separate subject. So it's only maths through English, science through English, social studies through English, but no English as a standalone subject. So that is one model. The other one is adjunct instruction. And this is usually at the university level. That's what uh, Brinton and I'll share the references later. So in this particular case, there is one teacher for language and one for content, and they come and teach together. So you're familiar with that too. Now, what happens with one person interdisciplinarity? One person interdisciplinarity uh, doesn't really work, or there are lots of problems for one person trying to bring in interdisciplinarity into the classroom. Because for you to acquire sufficient knowledge, 
for you to be sufficiently knowledgeable or for you to uh, know enough about a, another content while you are teaching English takes time and it's sheer redundancy. You don't really have to do that. Um, the other thing is there might be polarity, you know. So if I am an English teacher, which of course I am, and then you are asking me, Shema, please teach civics also along with English. I would definitely be biased towards English, right? I there will be some kind of polarity. There will, will not be a balanced examination of both civics and English in my classroom. So that's that's again uh, you know problem with one person kind of interdisciplinarity. So which is why an adjunct instruction seems to be the best model because in that way you can encourage synthesis of ideas. In that way you can bring in a balanced approach. To, uh, to all subjects or all, all disciplines being addressed and then um, and then bring in a, a true multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach into the classroom. Uh, just a second, I'll close this door because there is some disturbance. So um, the next point that I would like to mention is, therefore, when there is no one person, when there is no one person interdisciplinarity, what do we do? We move into something called TDT or teacher design teams. I don't know why I didn't put the full form here, which is called teacher design teams. I am also hoping that one of the previous speakers would have talked about it. If they haven't, I'll be willing to do that at the end of the session. Okay. So um, we collaborate through teacher design teams. The teacher design team, according to this person, Handel Sols, is any team that can have even, I mean, it, the team can have even just two people. You know, it can be just two teachers coming in together. And how is it different from other teacher collaboration? Because this TDTs or teacher design teams are formed for the exclusive purpose of curriculum designing, or in our case, curriculum redesigning. Also, collaborative curriculum redesigning is the reason why teacher design teams are formed. So instructors in this particular case work together because work with a purpose that is to bring in interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity into the classroom so they are collaboratively reconstructing the curriculum or instructional practices and they have a goal of redesigning or preparing lessons lessons that match a classroom need lessons that match the uh, needs of the student. So this is what TDTs are all about, teacher design teams are all about. And uh, let me quickly check if there is anything else that I need to tell you about it. That's it, yeah. So it's just that the TDTs are teams that are formed, to, formed for collaborative curriculum redesign. Now, how do we deliver that? Delivering can be via team planning, that is two or three members of TDT teacher design team sit together, they plan together, but one person delivers an individual instruction. Or it can be joint planning instruction and evaluation. Um, you, uh, Let me also ask you to recall what Lena was talking about in terms of assessment. So content being assessed and language being assessed. So it can be joint too. And state the objective separately and it is this kind of learning or this kind of uh, activities or instructional goals that lead to the last thing that I have mentioning on this slide, a phrase called significant learning. Significant learning is something that is a, a, a term that is introduced by uh, Professor Fink. That's the, the, Take a look at the last one. Okay, so Professor Fink talks about significant learning and multidisciplinarity in learning has 
huge potential to facilitate significant learning in our learners. Uh, do take a look at what the screen shows, you know, what the screen has in terms of elements of significant learning. So for learning to be considered significant learning, it should have imparted foundational knowledge, which is, of course, something that happens in most of our classes, right? In um, all of us are able to share foundational knowledge or impart knowledge or information to our students. However, in addition to information transfer, for learning to be considered significant learning, it should also lead to a student's ability to apply that knowledge, integrate knowledge, you know, as in bring in different, connect ideas from different sectors, different disciplines, different subjects. There must be a human dimension. They must be able to, this happens especially when they work together. They are able to link it with each other, link it with other disciplines. There is caring, there is affective factors coming in. So you see what's happening is not just cognitive domain, but also our social domain and affective domain are being changed through a significant learning experience. Now, this is what holistic learning is all about. This is what learning is all about. Those of you who've done be it uh, or you know anybody who's done any teacher development program will recall that all our lesson plans require aims and objectives. We are always asked to bring in aims and objectives of lesson plans. When we state objectives, most of the time we stick to just cognitive objectives. My students will learn, my students will understand all vague abstract terms, right? And that is when we have Bloom's taxonomy. I am not sure if uh, somebody has talked about it or if some of you are familiar with it. But you use Bloom's taxonomy to make your objectives clearer, make your objectives more relatable. However, Bloom's taxonomy is also only uh, only to do with the cognitive domain. It's it's not to do with the affective and the social domain. So uh, for learning to be considered holistic, you need to bring in changes to cognitive, social, and affective domain. And this is what significant learning is all about. You know, that's, and significant learning is something that can be achieved through multidisciplinary uh, learning. Now, um, here is an example. Um, let me see how I can share this with you, okay? Um, and this is something that I would like you to think about in terms of, uh, in, in terms of objectives. I can share two resources that talk about making sandwiches. So for the uh, the central theme, as you can see here, is food. Okay, here are two resources. So uh, let me go back to this. The central theme is food. And language-wise, I have identified... Uh, so uh, as the language input-wise, I have identified two tabs text for you, which I've put in the chat box. Both are about making a sandwich. OK, uh, take two slices of bread, apply this, spread butter, and filling, and close, and stuff like that. So a simple activity of uh, making a sandwich. Now, if you look at the lessons, you will see that one of the lessons can be used in, in terms of language. An objective can be to teach our students use of connectors or use of sequence markers. That is something that we can, because it says, first do this, then do this, after that apply this, and so on. OK. Now, what I would like you to think about is how much richer the objectives can become when you bring in input related to food from geography, science, mathematics, art, so on. OK, so think about that in terms of geography. So, uh, you know, why am I making you all do this? Because 
all that multidisciplinarity requires is a little bit of creativity. As teachers, we need to fashion a connection between subjects because subjects as they exist right now, whether in school or institutions of higher education, they are not built for interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity. So as teachers, we need to put in some effort and bring in um, bring in multidisciplinarity into our classroom. So take a look at this and I, you know, think about sticking to that making a sandwich text for language input. Okay, so I'm going to use that text. That's the text I have to use uh, as language input. Can you think of anything in science or geography or mathematics that can be brought into this classroom to make it multidisciplinary? Is there something that is there any concept or theme or idea that you can think of that's related to making sandwiches and which comes from geography or history or science or mathematics or all right yes origin of sandwich is is something that we can think of in terms of history yes how did it happen who who started it or or so on yes anything else about math because if you look at that text it says take two square slices and then you know you cut it in half Ma'am, I was about to tell that the uh, no, geometrical shapes, but uh, depends on the level that you are, you know. Absolutely, yes. yes. If you look at the sandwich text that I shared, they are very, you know, low level, basic level kind of text. So I think geometric shapes is something that you are, or, you know, at least the, the circumference or something like that is something we could, we could use in terms of math. What about geography? Uh, yes, you could think about the language. I'm also wondering if we can think about geography in terms of, yes, exactly, that's right, yes, the variations, the kind of things that we have in a sandwich, yes. Um, think of whose is a peanut butter jelly sandwich, definitely not ours, yes. Um, uh, even a bread butter jam, whose is that? And what do we have in, in place? Most of most of our sandwiches are the the green chutney or the you know the peanut chutney or you know sandwiches that are different. So I thought that could be a good input from geography. And uh, of course, in terms of science, it can be anything about the surface again yes depending on the level of the students the science input will also change so all that i'm saying is it requires critical thinking it requires creativity and nothing else there is nothing else to that will there is nothing else that is required for you to fashion or forge a link or you know find a connect between different concepts and themes that uh, that you need to bring in through your multidisciplinarity. And uh, yeah, so uh, basically, this is the idea of the talk. More content means more language, and it means better language performance. Then what you're seeing here on screen are performance descriptors of uh, speaking, descriptors of spoken performance. If you um, if you want to mark or or assess somebody's evaluate somebody's spoken performance or when you say that hey that person doesn't speak well or hey this person speaks well all that we are saying is uh, so for someone who is speaking well it means there is better accuracy there is good complexity and there is good fluency so fluency in terms of the rate of articulation, the speed of speech, the number of uh, pauses, the number of silent pauses, and so on. You know, everything is calculated in fluency. Accuracy, of course, we know that the grammatical accuracy, lexical accuracy, syntactic accuracy, and so on. Complexity is in terms of uh, the kind of grammar structure that you use. 
the kind of lexical complexity, you know, the kind of words, the number of syllables in the in the word, that is so on. You know, the the words that you use, how many syllables do they have? Do you use all monosyllable words, or are there com is there complexity in terms of words that you use, so on? So um, this is just an example from the spoken domain, from the domain of speaking. Of course, for reading, listening, and writing, you have other descriptors that mark your proficiency or level of expertise. So um, all, all, all these can be achieved if there is more content given to our students, more, um, more meaning or you know, more chances for meaning making given to our students. And uh, something that you can keep in mind in order to you know, succeed in this is the commences quadrant. I'm sure someone must have talked about this. But this is, of course, a, 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 an adaptation of commences quadrant. Think about, this is something that I started our talk with, to think about the cognitive complexity and the linguistic complexity of your tasks. When you bring in multidisciplinarity, if it is cognitively complex, try to make the linguistic aspect less challenging. Lena did mention this too. So if there is too much uh, uh, content-wise uh, activity, uh, content-wise overload that is being delivered through your multidisciplinary task, make it linguistically less challenging. And uh, if it is linguistically difficult, make the content simple you know make it easier for them to understand so this is an easy uh, task for you to remember when you create multidisciplinary multidisciplinarity in your tasks and um, uh, yes i'm sure this is also a familiar uh, thing for you content language integrated learning or content based learning or multidisciplinarity or english across curriculum whatever it is that you call it the aims remain the same forces they can be largely clubbed under forces one is of course achieving content which is a no-brainer all of us know that achieving content is a, is a large aim second is communication when they when your students are using language to acquire content and using language to learn more about that content, their own communication skills, their own language becomes better. And then, of course, cognition. Cognition is when they are thinking about concept formation and linking concepts from different disciplines and culture. OK, now I'm going to uh, move on from this. Let me um, put this in the chat box because I would like you to end this with a task. I'm not taking too much time explaining this because as teachers, we are familiar with this. What I've done is I have looked at um, the BA sociology um, syllabus of uh, School of Distance Education, University of Kerala. Um, the courses that they have, some of the courses that they have are international politics. Let me share this link with you, OK, so that some of you can be already there. I'm sharing a Google document link with you. This is the document. Do try and access this, OK? Huh. So um, they have, I have taken excerpts or, or I have taken text from three subjects, international politics, environmental sociology and social psychology okay and international politics has a lesson on feeding the world something about poverty and what happens you know global poverty as an issue and i have tried to link it with something called the tragedy of commons in environmental sociology and another a third text called the tipping point in social psychology so do go to the google doc that i've shared um we will look at that together so that way it becomes you know let me stop this answer garden and get to this okay because i thought 
this would be something that will explain ah okay many of you are here already right so um this is what i was telling you about this is the ba sociology program and um, i have tried to link international politics, social psychology, and environmental psychology. And in inter international politics, there is this text on feeding the world. It's about, do take a look at just this, these two paragraphs, OK? In contrast to Algeria, Brazil had a different approach to governing hunger. Take a look at the first two paragraphs and tell me if there is anything about language that strikes you. You know, what language element can we teach through this particular text any okay in terms of grammar listening speaking reading right grammar yeah grammar think about what grammar can you teach through this 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 text any grammar then connecting words yes ruth i thought connecting words is yes i thought that is uh, that and can you give me some examples tenses that's right yes so we could bring in tenses too um in contrast to although and uh, therefore and subsequently and so on that is in terms of um, you know connectors or linkers it can also be tenses because it's a good combination of past and present so that's one way of using it so that's about the language content okay so we're looking at the four c's here do take a look at the chat box for the four c's so this one talks about how brazil addressed poverty or hunger and how the president offers something and so on okay now this is linked with something called the tragedy of the commons in environmental sociology environmental sociology tragedy of commons talks about you know an example for tragedy of commons is overfishing when you take too much from public property or or common property that is that is what the, that is tragedy of commons when too many take while giving too little thought to the rest of the population whether it is cattle or humans the rest is usually tragedy that's the tragedy of commons you're taking too much from public property or common property like overfishing you're fishing a lot without thinking about others that's the tragedy of commons so you see the link between brazil addressing poverty and the tragedy of commons and the third text i have is from social psychology the tipping point this is from uh, malcolm gladwell's book how a small idea can make a big difference how one person can bring in a large uh, you know uh, a large a big change how something that can cross the threshold and become a global you know when we call a video viral something is viral this is what we mean so the tipping point is something that is related to what the president uh, president in brazil did in order to address poverty there so on so all i'm saying is it requires a little bit of reading and a lot of imagination and creativity that's it and whenever you have uh, you know some free time take a look at these texts closely and see if you can bring in objectives in terms of four C's, as in what are concepts learned? I just explained what the concepts are that you learn from this. And what is communication or language learned? We did mention connectors, we did mention tenses. I'm more interested in you trying to understand what's the culture, cultural implication. You know, what is the culture that one can learn from this? We're moving from Africa to Brazil to you know different places when you read these excerpts you will see there is culture coming in so do take a look at these texts in detail and see if you can bring in you know state objectives content objectives and language objectives separately and that i think would be a good activity that will make very clear to you how multidisciplinarity widens our horizons you know broadens the scope like i told you earlier this is the best that we can do as teachers because we do not create our curriculum we do not design our textbooks so the best we can do is bring in multidisciplinarity in terms of instructional practices and uh, that is uh, you know something that i would like to advocate uh, through this talk mm -hmm.